Hello, and welcome to our DC Motors and Motion Control Systems webinar. Uh, I'm Dorota Shortel. I'm the CEO of Simplexity Product Development, and I'm here to introduce the webinar and introduce our speaker, Doug Harriman, who is the CTO of Simplexity Product Development. Uh, before we get started, uh, just a quick uh, introduction here on the logistical details. So all of you, thank you for attending, are muted by default. Uh, the way you can communicate with us is in your uh, GoToWebinar window, there's a spot for questions. And in that spot, you can type in questions at any time. Uh, those questions we'll uh, take a look at, and at the end, there'll be a Q&A session. So we'll have Doug present all the content, and we will answer as many of those questions as we can at the end. But feel free to go ahead and type them in as uh, it goes along so you don't forget those questions. We will be sharing the slides and the recording after the webinar via email. And if there are, uh, if we run out of time and we can't get to all of your questions, you can certainly reach out to Doug directly and uh, ask those questions at a later date. So thank you for attending. And with that, I will be introducing Doug Harriman. Go ahead, Doug. Good morning. Uh, my name is Doug Harriman. I'm the CTO of Simplexity. So today, I'm going to talk to you about DC Motors. Uh, I'm going to provide a quick intro to myself give you a little background on my experience, then I'll go into an overview of motor types and some rec recommended applications for those types. I'll do a deep dive on brush DC motors and talk a bit about optimization of DC motor driven systems. So my background, I hold a bachelor's and master's in mechanical engineering with my master's focusing in the area of control systems. I've been at Simplexity Product Development for about the last five and a half years where I've served as the CTO for the past two years. At Simplexity, I lead the firmware, EE, and systems engineering team, and my technical work focuses on systems and control systems. Before joining Simplexity, I was at Xeris Wind as a senior systems engineer for about a year and a half, and prior to that, I was at Hewlett Packard for 14 years, the last dozen of which I served on the motion control systems team doing motion control system development for all the inkjet printing, um, desk jet, office jet, office jet pro, that sort of thing. Uh, my last two years at HP, I served as the lead for this team. So the goals for today, I'm uh, here to help you understand a bit more about which motor technologies work well and which types of applications, and then provide a deeper understanding of DC motors so you can ex effectively select and use them. And I'll do that by getting into um, a simple motor model for DC motors, and then we'll look at using that model to solve some real-world design challenges. So first up is motor types and recommendations. So there's lots and lots of different types of motors in the world today, uh, but there's really only three motor technologies that are applicable to high volume or higher volume products. Uh, the first of these is the brushless DC motor. This is typically the most expensive type of motor, it's ideal for applications that are wear sensitive. So because it doesn't have brushes, which are a wear element, it's really good for applications that either require high life or high speed. Brushless DC motors are simple to drive both algorithmically and electronically for velocity control, but require more complex drive electronics if you need to do position control. There's two major construction types for brushless DC motors. The first is the outer rotor. These are typically a lower cost version of the motor that can be good for high volume applications. Uh, they're typically using things like fan motors, spindles for laser printers or disk drives, and drone rotors. So the, uh, the upper picture there is a, a typical drone rotor motor. These motors have high inertia due to their disc-like form factor. So the fact that the rotor is on the outside, uh, that, that leads to a higher rotary inertia. And that makes it good for constant velocity applications or those where velocity ripple is a bad thing. Um, this high rotor inertia helps smooth out ripple. The other type is the inner rotor. That is typically a higher cost design. It's most common in commercial and industrial applications. It's typically uh, constructed for smooth torque generation, so more time and energy is put into making sure the magnetics generate a very smooth torque. And the cylindrical form factor 
allows for lower inertia. And that makes this motor better for start-stop applications where a low motor inertia is beneficial. The second common type of motor is the stepper motor. These are available in a wide range of costs and can be very, very low cost. They're pretty simple to drive. They're used in just about every cheap 3D printer in existence, and that's because you can buy chips off the shelf that can deal with the, the complexities of driving the motor, and you can simply provide them a step and direction input and get motion. They're typically pretty loud compared to other motor types. Uh, Micro-stepping these can help, and there is an interesting technology called field-oriented control for steppers, so that's taking field-oriented control for brushless DC motors, making some modifications, and applying that to stepper motor drive. That's not in widespread use, but it does seem like it might be growing. Uh, some downsides to stepper motors, they're typically oversized significantly to provide adequate torque margin. They're often used because you don't need feedback to drive position control, but without feedback, it's hard to assess torque margin. So people typically design these motors on the order of 2x larger than needed so that they can be confident they have sufficient torque margin. There can be issues with mid-frequency resonance, so that has to do with the driving, and it, halfway through the, uh, the rated speed, they can have issues pulling out and, and getting to higher speeds. Uh, but in general, I think stepper motors are a great solution when the NRE costs outweigh the direct material cost in the overall cost picture for your product. So if you're doing test beds or very low volume designs and you don't have time to invest in really understanding your system with a lot of detail, you just need something to move, stepper motors can be a great solution. The third type of motor we'll talk about is the brush DC motor. So these are available at a wide range of sizes and costs. You can find them extremely cheaply, so well under a dollar with sufficient volume, up to hundreds of dollars for very high-end, precise designs. They're the easiest, drive, easiest to drive. You can attach a DC motor directly to a power supply and it will spin, unlike a brushless DC or a stepper motor. Or if you need to do speed control in a unidirectional uh, mode, you can just attach a single switch. They can yield very high performance to cost ratios, so that makes them very good for high volume, and they're thus the most prevalent motor technology in high volume applications. And DC motors will be the focus of the presentation today. So first thing we'll do is get into a basic DC motor model. So here's a diagram of the construction of a DC motor. So on the outside we have the stator magnets. Typically you have two permanent magnets. We have an armature formed of a stack of stamped steel. Uh, these, these are called laminates. So you build up the armature by stamping a bunch of pieces, stacking them together, and then around that armature you create the winding, so winding copper wire. And that wire is what's used to create the magnetic field, the rotating magnetic field. The windings are fed by the commutator and brushes, so the brushes are attached to the DC voltage applied externally, and through the commutator, the voltage is transferred to the windings. Now, you can see the commutator is, is slitted there, and so as the brushes uh, make contact with different sections of the commutator ring, the voltage is applied to different windings. So getting into a a model of that, so you can see in the lower right there is a schematic diagram of the motor. We have on the left side is the electrical portion of the motor, so we have an applied voltage VA. There is a winding resistance and winding inductance for this motor. And then the section M, uh, that represents the motor portion, the torque generation and back EMF generation portion of the motor. So any DC motor can act as a motor if you apply voltage or can act as a generator if you spin the shaft, it will generate voltage. And so that, that section there represents the transfer of electrical to mechanical energy. So out of that we get a torque. That torque is applied to the inertia of the motor yielding an output velocity and position theta. A couple key parameters for this motor um, that all focus on that area M in the middle of the diagram are the torque constant and the back EMF constant. So these represent how the electrical and mechanical energy are related. Note that KT and KE are formed by the same physics. That's the physics of a conductor moving through a magnetic field, so that's the winding moving through the permanent 
magnetic field generated by the stator magnets. And if you have the correct unit system, those values are actually uh, numerically identical. So the key equations in this, this model are, first one is the torque equation. So the output torque is the KT times the motor current, so the, the winding current, IA. The back EMF generated is the back EMF constant, KE, times the motor velocity. And then the final equation is simply the, uh, the current loop equation. Uh, note that I crossed out the inductance term. Typically, the inductance is negligible for most designs for this type of motor. So I, in all uh, future uses here, we'll see that I, that term drops out. So some things to think about when using this motor model. There's a few gotchas. So it's the basic model, as shown, is really works very well for motor sizing. And it works well for control within the limits imposed by some non-ideal behaviors. So the first of these is magnetic saturation. So the steel of the, the motor, so both the external can and the laminate stack, have to carry the magnetic field. At some point, you can increase the the generated field sufficient that you saturate that steel and it can no longer carry any additional flux. So if you put too much current through a motor, you'll find that the torque production does drop off. There's also a series of nonlinear spatial behaviors. So those, uh, those, are, those crop up due to the idealizations used in the model. So the first of these is the overall resistance of the motor. So it's typically an average value that's reported and measured. We can see at, uh, at low speeds, or if you carefully measure as you rotate the, the shaft by hand, you'll see this is an average value. And as the commutator shorts, you'll see variation in this value. And as different winding coils come in and out of contact with the commutator, you're actually putting these coils in series and parallel with them. And as the motor rotates, you get different combinations there. And that will change the effect of resistance at different positions. You'll also see some effects on KE and KT due to the magnetic field, vari field variation. And that's because the laminate stack is not perfectly round. There are slits in it. And so the magnetic path through the motor from the permanent magnets changes. So one of the major effects you'll notice is the cogging torque. So if you grab a motor and turn the shaft by hand, you'll feel uh, detents where there's stable positions and unstable positions. That's just due to the reluctance path of the magnetics through that steel. There's another effect uh, called commutation torque, and that has to do with switching the winding coils at speed. So you're switching an inductor. When you switch an inductor, you get a voltage spike, and that voltage spike will cause a current flow, which can cause a ripple torque also. There's a few other things to be aware of. So the motor parameters, KT, KE, and RA, are, all have variation to them. So typically for high volume applications, you'll see plus or minus 10 to 15% variation in those parameters. For more expensive DC motors, those values can be a lot tighter, but for high volume, that's a, a good range. The effective resistance has a dependency on life. So those motor brushes riding on the commutator ring, as they wear over time, they will seat better and actually reduce the effective resistance as the contact resistance there goes down. And finally, a key parameter in, in any model will look at some of the inputs. And if you're working with high volume power supplies, the applied voltage typically has a 10 to 15% variation also. And so if that's an important parameter in your model, you need to be aware of that variation. The motor also has temperature sensitivity. So the coil winding resistance will increase with temperature. And that's simply a property of copper. So the windings are made of copper wire, and copper does increase its resistance with temperature. On the other side of the motor, on the outside, the permanent magnets, they, uh, their magnetic field strength will go down with temperature. So you'll see a reduction in both KT and KE with temperature. And the net effect of both of those is the motor tends to get weaker as it gets hotter. OK, so the next section we'll go into is how to use this model for motor selection and for system optimization. So the general problem you, for motor selection is you've been asked to pick a motor and hopefully a gear ratio to deliver a required torque and speed to the load. And I'm 
clearly specifying a difference between load and motor here because you can use a gear ratio to change the mapping between torque and speed at the load and the motor. So it's important that when you're asked to select a motor, you're also allowed to pick a gear ratio. You can get a lot better optimizations that way. You need to do this design in, in the, uh, with a set of constraints. So any real world engineering problem has constraints. Typical constraints for motor selection are maximum allowed voltage, maximum current, maximum power, and maximum temperatures in the system. So the voltage typically comes because the power supply voltage has often been selected. Current is limited both by power supply and drive electronics. Power supplies also typically have power draw limits. And then there's a series of temperatures like the motor itself, the drive circuits, power supply that will have maximum temperatures. Um, temperature is usually driven by I squared R losses in the system, which clearly is a function of current, but you may have different maximum current and maximum temperature driven time frame. So the maximum current may have a very, very small duration that it can support, whereas maximum temperature is a longer term value. So the input variables for this problem are the, the motor parameters, KT, KE, R, and J, and the gear ratio. If you're lucky, some of these other electrical parameters may be values that you can change in your design. If you're allowed to do a full system optimization, those should be put under consideration. So you might be able to pick a higher supply voltage, um, get larger drivers or a larger power supply. And when you're looking at designs, a lot of these things come in discrete values as do motors, and sometimes you can pick a smaller motor, but I'd say a larger driver, and while you're spending more on the electronics, you save more than that in picking a smaller motor, and you, get, you can drive an overall cheaper system. So the typical process for selecting motor when not using model, as I've seen it, is an EE has specified a voltage, and they've asked you to go find a motor that, that work with that as a rated voltage. So you go out looking at motor supplier, Motor curves um, look typically looking for that rated voltage. So the graph at the right shows typical motor curves specified by a, a motor supplier. Uh, they're always the shape. Often they'll have the same graph on motor after motor, and they just change the labels on the X and Y axes. So the important line here is the blue line that goes from the no load speed down to the stall torque. And the general problem is to pick a motor such that the torque speed operating point lies below that line. You can use the gear ratio to, to move your load points on the torque speed plane. So this is actually the, the motor output torque. So changing that gear ratio can allow you to move your point around. And then you'll be looking at different motor curves for different windings and different motors. So the issues with this technique are it can be pretty difficult to compare different designs. So you kind of have a point on a plane as opposed to any graph relating the designs. Typically, you get these curves for only one rated voltage from a supplier. The rated voltage is, is usually the voltage that the manufacturer tested at. So uh, we're talking about simply uh, brushes and a coil of wire. So you can run motors at a lot of different voltages. Often you can run them above their rated voltage because it's really just a, the voltage it was tested at. There's nothing fundamentally uh, important about that rated voltage. And you can always run the motor at a lower voltage. But it's not always clear how to generate new curves if you are just given one of these curves if you want to run at a lower voltage. Another problem that can crop up is what is the rated operating torque for start-stop motion? So as this graph shows, there's a rated continuous torque line that's great if you're running at a constant load and speed point, but if you're doing start-stop motion, it's not always clear what that, that point would be. And then we need to know how working at different operating points affects other components in the design. And, and these curves can help you get there, but it's not abundantly clear how the motor power, the motor driver, the power supply, those sorts of components are affected by a, selecting a point on this curve. So you can use a motor model to help you do the motor selection process. Um, and the most important thing you can do is you can start generating your own motor curves. So if you know the KT and the RM, which you can extract from motor curves, you can generate new curves for yourself. 
So that's shown here on the right. This is uh, just something I found on the web. Someone had generated some different motor curves. And what they've shown is the torque speed curve for a given motor at different drive voltages. So you can see as the voltage goes down, the, the torque speed curve line shifts to the left. So that's pretty important. Um, and then you can look at the trajectory of different operating points for different gear ratios on that plot. So this one happens to show going from a one-to-one -one gear ratio to a six-to-one gear ratio. So one thing I will point out, uh, there are a few gotchas in operating at higher voltages. Um, you do need to stay below safety limits, so be sure that you don't ask for voltages that are outside of different uh, regulatory limits. So typically the maximum is going to be somewhere in the 20 to 42 volt range where you start getting into different safety areas for voltage. And if you're doing lower volume designs, I recommend looking only at standard power supply voltages so you don't drive additional cost in your power supply. For high volume designs with custom power supplies, that's often not a constraint. One other thing to be aware of is some motors come with a varistor ring. So this is a ring, ring that's soldered on to the commutators, or not the brush, but the, the commutator ring in the motor. And it's used to limit the EMI output of the motor. So as the motor windings are switched in and out by the commutator ring. You are switching an inductor, which can drive high voltages and cause arcing between the commutator rings, which is, will generate a lot of EMI. So a varistor ring, a, which is a variable resistor, can be used to shunt that current to the other coils and drastically reduce the EMI output of the motor. Those varistor rings are designed for specific drive voltages, so you do need to be careful that if your motor has a varistor ring, you get a varistor ring designed for your drive voltage. So here's an example of a design I did this summer uh, for selecting a new motor. So this is for a client, a real client, and what they had was a design at a one-to-one -one gear ratio with the blue line motor curve here. So the original motor, this looks at the motor efficiency versus gear ratio. And you can see they were operating at a very inefficient point for this motor. This motor was running about 15% efficiency. And by analyzing the system, uh, I selected a new motor that was, while less efficient, was about half the cost of the original motor. And what we did was we also recommended a change in gear ratio to run at a much more efficient point. So this, these graphs show the recommended design for this system. So as you can see, going from two, from one to one to two and a half to one for the gear ratio, we drove the motor efficiency up quite a bit from say 14 or 15 percent to the mid upper 20 percent range. In doing that, we dropped the motor current requirements down to about their optimum. So that was about a 23 percent reduction in required current. Now the trade-off there was we did need a higher drive voltage. We were using a smaller motor, and to, to get lower current, we we ended up spinning the motor faster with the gear ratio, so we needed a higher voltage, and we increased the drive voltage by about 19%. Now, overall, that is less power for the motor, and we were able to pull less powder power with this motor because we were operating at a more efficient point. Uh, the graph on the lower left shows the driver temperature rise driven by this the current. So you can see we went from a driver temperature rise of close to 55C down to the mid-high 30s. That was very important with, for this client because they were having heating issues for this design. So this is one that shows that uh, by properly optimizing your system, you can really, really get a much better design. A key benefit here, you can see by having the model, we were able to directly compare multiple motors on the same graph, and we were able to compare a continuous range of drive ratios so that we could easily compare how these designs work against each other. And using a model there instead of just a bunch of different graphs with single points on them really helps you compare families of designs and pick the best design. So a little more advanced for motor selection, another optimization that is possible is motors can be rewound. Often when you look at a motor from a motor vendor, you'll see one set of motor curves, and if you're lucky, there might be two or three for a given motor, and those different curves typically represent different windings for a motor. So when you rewind a motor, what you're doing is selecting a different wire diameter. There's standard wire diameters, and motor fenders tend to carry a bunch of those, a bunch of different standard values. When you use a different wire diameter, you get a different number of turns in a given winding. So more amp turns gives you more 
more electric field out of that coil, so that will give you more torque. The trade-off is using a smaller smaller wire diameter to get those amp turns is you've got more length of copper, which means you have a higher resistance. So when you rewind a motor, basically what you're doing is you're getting a new resistance and torque constant, and of course, back EMF constant too. So you're basically changing the impedance matching capabilities between electrical and mechanical domains for this motor. It should be noted that this does not change the motor efficiency, but you are changing the characteristics such that you can get either a motor with more torque, which tends to run, is used in slower applications, or you can wind it to run faster with less torque. The change for the supplier is really not that big a deal. They have to change the programming on the motor winder and they have to load in the different wire diameter. So for low volumes, it's, it's unlikely you'll get to do this, but if you have High volumes, motor vendors typically will do this for you, and really at high volume, it should not affect the cost of the motor at all because it's just a programming change and loading a different wire diameter. Uh, a key thing to understand with rewinding a motor is there's a parameter called the motor constant that relates the motor torque constant to the winding resistance. And it's this KM that controls what you can do when you rewind a motor. So KM, the motor constant, is constant across a given motor size and technology. So for a given motor, as you change the winding diameter, wire diameter, you get a different KT and RA as related by this KM. So you can see how those two will play off against each other. Now, while I, when I say it's constant for a given motor size and technology. Clearly it's for a given motor size and the, when I say technology here I'm referring to both the motor type, so a brushless motor, a stepper motor, or a DC motor. They all, you can calculate a KM for each of those. And the other key parameter is the magnet type. So if you go to a higher power magnet, like going from a ceramic magnet to a rare earth magnet, the KM will change there. So this is, this motor is constant only within a given size motor and magnet technology. Note that in general, the motor constant does increase with size. The, the trade-off there is that you also get a higher rotor inertia as you increase your motor size. And the, the graph on the right shows the motor constant and the motor inertia, how they're related through a series of different motors that I've worked with through the year. You can see it's kind of a second order effect there. So going to a larger motor often helps, but it can also cause you to dump more power into accelerating the rotor inertia. Okay, moving on, we're gonna look at a couple other model uses. So the first thing we can do uh, that's pretty cool with the model is we can use it to do a real-time temperature estimation of the motor. So this is figuring out the motor temperature in real time without putting a, a temperature sensor on the motor itself. It do, you do this by estimating the power dissipation from a model and then using a heat transfer thermal model to figure out how the motor temperature changes with time. To do this, you do require some sort of feedback on the motor performance, so either position or velocity feedback will work, and you do need an ambient temperature measurement, so typically an ambient temperature sensor of some sort. Um, that's because we're estimating the temperature rise in the motor, not the absolute temperature directly. Now, the good news is uh, there's lots of low-cost temperature sensors that are easy to put on a main PCA. It just can be more expensive to route a temperature sensor to the motor, which is why this may be beneficial. Um, in application, we've seen this type of system able to estimate the motor temperature within plus or minus three degrees centigrade. A really important thing to note about using the model to estimate motor temperature in real time is that the estimate is load invariant. So the way this system works is you're looking at the power that goes into the motor and you're looking at the power that comes out and noting that the difference between those two is the power dissipated in heat. And the way these systems work is you're, you're doing that in real time and you're not making any assumptions about the load. You're just looking at power in versus power out. So loads can change on you and the model doesn't lose any accuracy. So this shows an example of some performance of a system like this uh, that I implemented when I was back at HP on this given printer. Now I'll note that this data here, anyone could take, all you need is to put a thermal couple on a motor and uh, measure time performance uh, print speed. So there's no proprietary data being shared here, but it does provide a nice example of the performance of the system. So what you're seeing here in the graph is the red line represents the motor temperature. 
and the blue line represents performance, so it's time to print a given print job that we were using for characterization. So we were running this real-time thermal estimate of the motor temperature and using that to implement a temperature controller on top of the normal controller for the motor speed uh, for the carriage, moving the print cartridges back and forth in this printer. And what you see is the motor temperature ramps quickly as the system starts running and then steady states out to around 53 degrees C. The target here was 55 C, but there are some errors in the model as I noted and it got to what it thought was 55, had a little bit of error, but did control the temperature very well. And what you see in the performance is the system is running at around 50 seconds per print job until around the fourth or fifth job where thermal protection, the con temperature control algorithm kicks in. Then it slowly starts to degrade performance until around the tenth job at which it really kicks in and, and degrades performance to keep the temperature under control. So by doing this, we were able to use a much smaller motor in the system than you would otherwise need to print really long print jobs. And the trade-off there was most people print very short print jobs, whereas this one was able to print hundreds of pages before slowing down, and most users never uh, experienced this degradation in performance. So it was a large cost savings for the product line. Another use for the model is applying safety limits in software. So you can use the model to figure out the maximum allowed input voltage to keep from breaking things. And you can do this all without uh, an additional sensor. So the first use and probably the most important one is limiting motor current. So this formula shows you how to limit your applied voltage if you have a current limit and that's as a function of speed. And a reason you may want to do this is you have an application where you need a high voltage to run at high speeds but if you were to apply full voltage at low speeds you would pull too much current because you don't have the back EMF helping you and that could blow your driver. So this allows you to calculate a voltage limit as a function of speed, apply that to your control in real time, and keep from breaking your motor drivers. You can do something similar with motor torque. This just applies a KT equation to the equation above, and what you get is a calculation of your maximum voltage for your torque as a function of speed. Uh, this can be really good for any time you need to limit the, the force applied to something. So if you do a hard stop home and you want to do it at a lower torque than, than you would if you didn't have a limit in place, uh, allows you to use lower, lower forces there but yet retain all the torque necessary for normal operation. And finally, a more complex formula is a limit for power supply draw. So this limits the overall power drawn by the system as a function of speed by applying a voltage limit. And of course, there's no reason you can't run all three of these calculations in a system and just apply the minimum in real time so that you don't break anything. Uh, so another application is sensorless speed control. So this is something pretty cool that you can use if you need a very low cost system and you need speed control that isn't super tight, but you do need something. And so we're gonna estimate speed using our model. And I'll show you one case without a, mo without a sensor and then another couple of implementations that use a current sensor. Um, the, and then we'll go into example that I did for a high volume consumer product company about a year ago. So the first kind of naive implementation of this is simply looking at the back EMF. So doing an open loop implementation where you say, I know what the back EMF is, so using that information, I can calculate the speed. So you see the series of equations, manipulating those, we get a calculation for an applied voltage as a function of load and desired speed. So you figure out what the load of the system is, you can then implement this voltage, you apply this voltage to your system based on the desired speed for the system. There are a few problems with this implementation. So uh, the load estimate will always be an estimate and so it's going to be wrong so you won't hit the speed you want to hit. Um, and that can be, a, can be a real problem especially if there's a lot of variation to your load. Like all the techniques I'm going to show, we won't know the motor parameters exactly and they do, motor, they do vary with temperature which can change the effect of the applied voltage and will yield a different motor speed. So in general, I don't recommend using this technique because the performance just tends to be fairly poor. 
The next technique implements uh, a bit of feedback to help out. So the idea here is you add a current sense resistor to your system. So on the output of your motor driver, you add a small resistor and you use an A to D on your microcontroller to measure the, the voltage across that resistor, giving you a measurement of the current going to the motor. So by doing this, you have a bit more information of your system, about your system, and you can come up with an estimated speed. So that's the omega hat. The hat represents an estimate um, based on both the applied voltage and the, the measured current. So this will give you a much better estimate. But there are a few problems here. Uh, like I said before, you still don't know your motor parameters exactly. Um, although with this system, you can do some measurements on the production line with additional sensors that allow you to better estimate those unit by unit and get, can get a lot better performance. Do note though that the, any errors in the back EMF constant directly scale your speed estimate, so that will generate estimation error. Another important point here is that any noise on your current measurement will bleed directly to noise in your velocity estimate. And you'll see current estimation noise, or sorry, current measurement noise, mainly due to commutation of the motor. So the motor, since it's spinning and commutating the motor coils um, asynchronously to any measurement that you do, you're going to get uh, some, some noise on this reading. There's going to be a, quite a bit of variation on that. Uh, there can also be issues with incorrect sampling. You do need to be, take care to make sure that you sample the current during the PWM on time. Most microcontrollers have uh, hardware that will support you to do this. So this graph shows a, a simulation of the technique presented in the last slide for motor speed control. So the idea here is there's a we're using the motor speed estimation technique to come up with a speed estimate and then using that for speed feedback control. So the red line represents the target speed, so we're ramping up from zero to a little over 200 radians per second, and we're trying to run at a constant velocity then. So the blue line represents the estimate of the algorithm presented, and the black represents an actual. Again, this is all simulated, and what I've done here is thrown in a 5% error on the back EMF constant, and you can see how that directly manifests in a 5% estimation error for the motor speed. The next thing I did in the simulation is I applied some noise to the motor current reading in the model. And you see there what that does is it causes a large amount of noise to be, get reflected onto the estimated winding speed. Uh, it's hard to see, but there is a little bit of ripple then coming through into the motor speed because that noise is getting fed back through the controller and causing the input to change somewhat. So in general, this, this technique works okay, but there's uh, one more update we can do to this algorithm to get a little better performance. So the next update to this is using an observer. So an observer is a common technique used in advanced control algorithms to provide additional information about the system performance. So we're going to, in this system, not estimate velocity directly, but we're going to estimate current and use a, an error term of the measured current versus the estimated current to update our velocity estimate and then use that velocity estimate to update our current estimate. So you end up with a little feedback loop here and we use an estimator gain, K estimate, as the value that provides our updated estimate. So essentially what we've done is added an integration step here and by integrating the noisy reading uh, IA we've reduced the overall noise in the system. Now, we have done nothing to address parameter error, estimation error, but we do reduce the noise. And so applying this technique to the same simulation shown in the last slide provides this graph. And you can see there's a pretty drastic reduction in the noise of the estimated velocity, which then smooths out the actual velocity a bit more and also helps you if you need to make decisions on your velocity, like crossing a threshold speed, that sort of thing, removing a noise is very helpful for those sorts of algorithms. So given the results of the simulation, I implemented this system in hardware. So the hardware setup is, there's a photograph on the right, and the general description is I used the Simplexity Snap Mechatronics board. So this is a, a board we've developed internally to use as a reference design and 
for bringing up systems for clients and doing different sorts of development work. It consists of a microcontroller, uh, various motor drivers, and other inputs and outputs. For this test, I used a motor with an encoder mounted on the shaft. Now, the, the encoder was only used to verify the motor velocity estimate performance. It was not used for speed control. So we're going to implement the observer as, as described on the previous slide and then use that in a motor speed feedback controller and then look at the encoder to see how well we performed. In addition, during the test, I grabbed the shaft of the motor to see how well the estimator handled those sorts of input perturbations and how well the, the controller could react to that. So these graphs represent the results of the test. So uh, on the left, you can see the measured speed and the estimated speed. Again, that's measured as measured by the encoder and then the output of the estimator. Uh, around 14 seconds, you can see where I grabbed the shaft and the motor slowed down. And then around 16 seconds, I released it uh, the, and the motor speed sprung forward a bit, ramped up, and then the controller brought that back under control. So in the upper right, you see the PWM the input voltage to the system. You can see how the feedback controller reacts when I grab the shaft and then when I let go. And the, on the uh, lower right, you can see how the current, measured current, reacted. And that's the current as measured by the, uh, by the system for and used for the estimator. So overall, the system performed really well um, and was, was a useful implementation. Okay, the, uh, the last thing I'm going to talk about well, it looks like we're running low on time, so... Well, I, actually, so if people want to type in questions now, um, now would be the time if you have any questions, and while those questions, if there are any coming in, Doug can cover this section, um, and then we, we can stay a little bit uh, a little bit later if we need to. Okay. So the last section is just a few tips and tricks for motor control that I've come across during the year. So. First of all, almost all motor applications require some form of speed control. Sometimes this can be uh, simple like a fan and uh, a brushless DC driver provides all the speed control that, that you need, a stepper motor, that sort of thing, where you don't need feedback. But in general, feedback brings a lot of benefits. So sensors provide important information about sensor performance and thus are often well worth the cost of adding to a system. So one of the most important things they do is they allow you to assess your torque margin during test. So as I mentioned earlier, stepper motors are often oversized by 2x to provide sufficient torque margin. With a DC motor and a sensor, you can much better understand your torque margin and can get by with a lot smaller motor. Often savings are more than enough to pay for that feedback sensor. Uh, sensors can help you find mechanical disturbances, so you may have areas in your system where there's high friction or some sort of binding, and without a sensor, it can be very difficult to diagnose those problems. They can be used to provide useful metrics, both on the production line and in the field, to understand uh, maybe assembly errors that are causing high loads in the system, or to look at increased friction over time, maybe as uh, lubricants are, are migrating out of the, the drive components. And then they can also often be used to enable more advanced behaviors and features in your product. So in general, I found that sensors can be very, very useful. Uh, when, you're, when you're adding sensors to your system for feedback control, I recommend that you always measure what you care about. So put the feedback element as close to the output as possible. Often people want to try and gain increased resolution by putting, the motor, by putting the, an encoder on a motor shaft and getting a resolution increase through the gear train. It will do that. There are benefits to doing that. But what you've done then is you've made anything downstream of the sensor, it's open loop. And so if you need to have precise motion downstream of that, in, that sensor, you're going to require better mechanics. So it's just important that you understand that what the trade-offs are when you do that. Um, and I, I will point out, some people don't realize this, but you don't need to know the motor position for DC motors to control the system. You're just trying to control the load, and you can control, any feedback loop will control the overall system. There's no need to, to directly understand the motor position. Uh, this, another thing you can, I'll point out, is that current control does not work well in brush motors. So you saw in the examples of the hardware test how noisy that value is. 
Uh, if you're trying to use that to control current directly in a DC motor, it's not going to work very well. Um, that said, it's a very common practice in brushless DC and stepper motors, and that's because those motors are electrically commutated, so a given coil, winding coil, is always directly attached to the drive electronics. In a brush DC motor, that's not true. The commutator ring is asynchronously bringing that those coils in and out of um, contact with a given drive circuit element. So thus you get very noisy current, and we found that current control isn't all that helpful. Um, when you do try and do current control, as I mentioned before, also you typically need a current sense resistor and a dedicated A to D channel. This isn't expensive, um, but it's often just a trade-off between uh, taking some of the motor parameter variation out of the system, adding in measurement system parametric variation. So remember that you need to well understand the excitation or the, the reference voltages for an A to D circuit, and you need to understand the tolerances in your current sense resistor, or those will drive errors in your system that may be equivalent to the to the variation errors you're taking out. Um, and as we pointed out, the system is the signals are very typically very noisy and can can cause problems, especially if you're trying to use noisy signals for control. With that, we'll just go through a quick review of what we covered today. So we've gone through common motor types and when to use them, talked about a mathematical model for DC motor operation, how to use that model to help you select a DC motor, and how to use that model to do different things in your control system to give you better control of a DC motor driven, driven system. And with that, looks like we don't have any questions right now. So we are out of time. And we are out of time, so we will wrap up. So thank you for attending today. Uh, please feel free to contact me if you have any follow-up questions about designs that you're working on today. Thank you. Thank you.